Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Paolo Volpin. I'm uh, the interim dean and a professor of finance here at CAS Business School. So I'm pleased to welcome you all this evening to the first Global Women Leadership Program event for 2020. And it will be a, a fireside chat with uh, Sir Philip Hampton and Denise Wilson OBE. Uh, thank you so much uh, for coming. It's wonderful to see all of you here tonight. Here at uh, uh, the Sir uh, John Cass Business School, we enable the extraordinary by cultivating excellence in the business leaders of tomorrow. Being a global leader requires drive, energy, and confidence, as well as exceptional business capability. That's why our purpose is to help individuals, firms, and industries thrive by creating and sharing knowledge, inspiring continual learning, and shaping practice, policy, and debate. With a global community of more than 16,000 alumni, we are proud to be one of an elite group of business schools to hold triple crown accreditation from the AACSB, AMBA, and Equis, and to be consistently ranked among the world's best business schools in the world. Here at CAS, we are committed to encouraging and supporting an inclusive, equal culture which is open to all. And a very important part of this is our uh, Global Women Leadership Program, our flagship initiative to nurture gender equity at CAS. Launched in uh, 2017 under the direction of my colleague, Dr. Jenan, uh, the program has three main work streams. It coordinates scholarships for bright, high potential women to study at CAS. It organizes events with inspiring speakers to equip and empower women with, for leadership, just like the event today. And it connects women by nurturing networks uh, for their su success. Now the program's event series is a very important part of uh, its work and we are very pleased tonight to welcome uh, Sir Philip Hampton and Denise Wilson here uh, to discuss their work on the Hampton Alexander Review. I think now there is a video that's supposed to start, but in the meanwhile, I just want to again thank you very much all of, all of you for coming and I hope you have a wonderful evening. Jonathan Hilmer, 
And first of all, I would like to say welcome to all of you. Thank you for joining us tonight. I see some familiar faces and I see some new faces, so that's wonderful. And of course, I would like to welcome uh, Sir Philip and Denise for joining us. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you. It's great to be here. Well, I'm, I'm very excited. Well, I'm so excited that my, my <laughs> gut stuck. It's going to come around the other side. Yes. So I am really excited that I can't even disentangle myself. <laughs> um, we, we want, I want to start the conversation by asking the big question of why. Why is it important to have women on boards? Sir Philip, I especially wanted to see what you think about this. Yeah, I mean, I, I think there are two big drivers here, and there's a bit of a clue in the sponsorship we get from government here, from the Department of Business and the Government Equalities Office. And I think those are the two prongs to it from my point of view. I start with the premise that talent is equally distributed between men and women. Uh, and so if talent is equally distributed over time, so should leadership positions. Uh, and obviously we start from something that's not at all like that. So from the point of view of having the best people in the top jobs, uh, we should have men, a much higher percentage of women in those top jobs. Otherwise, we're picking people who are not necessarily the best people. Unless you make the argument that women are less capable as leaders, which I think very few people, I suspect, in this audience uh, would make that argument. The second reason, and I think that's a powerful enough reason from my point of view, it's good for business to have the best people in the top positions, and that must include many more women. There is a, a second argument, which I think is also very important, and it matters actually incredibly to individual women, which individual women must be able to fulfill their own individual potential. And that's where the government equalities thing comes into it, which is, it's just fundamentally wrong if women are held back, and actually these things are matters of legislation. They're not matters of legislation at the top levels, uh, and I think it would be very difficult to legislate for that, not impossible, but very difficult to legislate for that. But, they, but there's something going wrong from the point of view of equal opportunity if we are denying women equal roles. So I think good for business and good for individual women, and that's why it's so important. Thank you. There is, there is also a question about why it should be important for women themselves to aspire to get on women. You have extensive experience on, on boards, what is your view on that? Um, well, I, you know, I've sat on many boards uh, in a non-executive or a chair capacity, different to my corporate career. And actually, you know, these are hugely rewarding and interesting opportunities, particularly later on in life as a, a second part of your career. Mm. But um, we all grow up in certain sectors, working with certain types of people. I grew up in the oil and gas and energy industry, so spent my career with engineers and accountants and, and, and learned to, to work my way through that. But when I sat on different boards, on insurance company boards, on a university board, on a, the Royal Academy of Arts board, I was mixing with very different people. I didn't have my positional status power. I didn't have my huge depth, in-depth knowledge of the industry. And I had to look very hard at how I added value and, and what skills did I bring to that board. And I had to try and influence and persuade with a whole series of, of different skills and behaviors mm -hmm. than those that I'd grown up using and those that I was used to. And, and I think that's a, um, you know, that's a, a very powerful lesson. And it, and it is very, uh, it builds a confidence as well to know that you have this set of skills that actually are very transferable from one sector to another. Um, but hugely interesting jobs too and, and hugely rewarding. At the right time, I think it's incredibly important for women, for everybody actually, to have a very strong, solid uh, executive career for as long as they possibly can, but then at, at the right time, um, hugely rewarding. Yes, and um, what I'm going to say doesn't apply only to women, but of course there's also a huge benefit to the board to have people with diverse backgrounds come, to the, come into the board and bring in a fresh perspective, which is sometimes discussed. Um, now let me switch to the Hampton Alexander Review. And let's start by 
celebrating some of the positives. Uh, the review has been around in, in two different forms for the last almost 10 years. What do you think have been the successes for um, FTSE companies? I think you just touched, touched on it actually there, Jan, and, and Denise did as well. Uh, I mean, if you go right back to the beginning, you know, why did this initiative start? Uh, it started in the wake of the financial crisis. Uh, and it started with a big focus on the banks. The ba you know, so many banks went bust in this country, and indeed in other countries, but you know, London in particular was a, UK was an epicenter of the, uh, the global financial crisis. And one of the things that the regulators did was, and indeed Shell, was look at the boards of banks and try and work out why dynamically so many banks had failed. What was it about all these, you know, supposedly distinguished and able and capable people that had let banks go bust for the first time in this country for 150 years? And uh, there are loads and loads of lessons to be learned from the financial crisis, but one of the lessons that was derived from it, rightly or wrongly, was that the boards did not enjoy sufficient diversity. Mm -hmm. uh, they were basically stuffed with people like me, if you like. They were, they were men of a certain age in grey suits, which I have sort of popular one today. Um, and, uh, you know, from rather similar backgrounds. Mm -hmm. Uh, and if you like, one of the most important things I think on a board of, of any company is the, the person who asks the really, really uncomfortable question. Uh, and that, that, that can come from people of a similar background, but diversity is more likely to produce the really different or difficult questions rather than the clubbiness or chumminess, including male clubbiness and chumminess. Uh, that characterise boards in general and arguably boards of banks in particular. And I, I became chairman of the board of Royal Bank of Scotland, which had 18 members. I mean, first of all, that's way too many for any board, in my view. Uh, 17 men. And if you like a token woman, she was a very impressive woman, but I think she was on the board so that they could say, you know, they had a woman on the board. Um, and uh, I think that was a contributory factor. The board was not sufficiently diverse, and that's what the regulator concluded in the sort of detailed reports that were done on the collapse of the Royal Bank of Scotland. So um, I think the, the single biggest achievement is we now expect boards to be diverse. We expect them to be diverse in gender terms and increasingly drawing people in from different backgrounds rather than, you know, mates of the chairman or, or whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, gender diversity to me is the most fundamental diversity, um, but we are increasingly talking about, and there's a government review on ethnic diversity as well, because, uh, you know, ethnic variations in populations are not subsidiary to the traditional white population, if you like, of this country and indeed other, other uh, countries. So I would expect over time we'll see more people from wider ethnic backgrounds in leadership positions and on boards. Yes. But diversity is just so fundamental for any rich debate. Yes. And, and, I, and I, think, um, I think, you know, going back to what has been successful, in, in the UK we've taken a very different route to pretty much every other country in Europe, we've taken a voluntary, persuasive, business-led approach, uh, whereby we have cajoled, educated, persuaded, sometimes a little bit with the arm up the back, um, industry leaders to, to, to do the right thing. Um, in the early days, we sold the business case uh, very hard, very heavily. These days, um, we don't need to talk quite so much about the business case. Most leaders get it, understand that this is a you know, critical business imperative. And most business leaders uh, know the right thing to say and are, are working very hard uh, to improve their gender balance. But um, you know, what, what, what was fundamental to the success? I think the way British business works, a, a law and a legislation and a quota uh, would have been quite difficult to swallow, particularly in 2010. So, you know, we're led very much not by a set of legislation and rule books, but by a corporate governance guide and the code, corporate governance code, and um, a complier explained. So that that voluntary, encouraging, educating, influencing. Uh, style played out very well. I think the other thing that was critical, there's, there's a couple of other things, but data, actually collecting and publishing on a regular basis, the data, uh, not just in the aggregate, but by individual company. And you know, you, for those of us who've been following for some years, you'll see that each year the level of disclosure gets bigger and deeper and more uncomfortable for those that are uh, frankly, going too slow or nowhere, and and that has been um, 
you know, that has been very fundamental to success. No chair, CEO, company wants to see themselves in the headlines. The press have also been incredibly um, active on this agenda and driven progress, latterly investors. And, you know, many, many, many uh, businessmen and businesswomen who have got behind it in a way. I think, frankly, in 2011, we could only have glimpsed at this progress. We have a long way to go and we're not there yet. But it has worked, is working uh, very well for us in the UK. And I want to follow up on that because I've, I've talked to and listened to Denise a few times and you can rattle off numbers like nobody else. So what would be some key figures that for you would really support that we have come a long way? Well, well, I mean, I'll just start with this one, which is our kind of big blast out there all the time we use. In 2010, when we first gathered the data, there were 152 all-male boards in the FTSE 350. Um, now, if you can imagine the atmosphere in those boardrooms of 10, 15, 20 senior men sat around that table versus now we have no all-male boards and three, four, five, six women sat at that table. The changed conversation, the changed nature of the debate uh, and the perspectives that are added to those business uh, decisions has been, has been huge. Um, we have now when we're measuring, which again is a sign of progress, not all male boards because we have none, but one and done boards. So those boards that have a tokenistic approach and have only appointed one woman. And, you know, it took us a while to sort of cotton on to this, actually, didn't it? Perhaps because we were quite focused on the all-male boards numbers. But we suddenly, when we looked, we saw there were, just the year before last, 76 boards that had one woman. And not only had they just had one woman recently, they'd appointed that woman three, four, five, six years ago and were clearly going nowhere. So now we measure those and there's just 30 of them which, um, you know, that in itself is, is progress. You saw some of the stats up there. The FTSE 100 in the aggregate has just hit um, the 33%, which is our target for the end of uh, 2020. But within that, that is an average, there's about 60 companies who are at 33% and above, and many, many now pushing forward for gender balance and not happy with that minimum threshold. But there's another 35-ish companies that are going slow, and some are still quite well adrift from that target. So we have what we call leaders and laggards, and, and very much um, part of our role and what we're doing at the moment is celebrating those leaders and shining a little bit of an uncomfortable spotlight on those laggards. Mm -hmm. And Sir Philip, for the companies that are the leaders, what do you think are the key enablers that got them to this point? I think you know, that there's just one gigantic enabler, which is basically leadership. Uh, and Denise mentioned you know, companies that get it. Uh, if you've got <coughs> senior figures in the boardroom, um, certainly the chairman, definitely the chief executive, saying that this is an important issue. I mean, like any issue, frankly, in a, if, if a, the top people in a company are saying, this is what we want to be known for, this is what we're going to focus on, this is what we're going to do in the, over the next you know, X years, then it normally gets done or it certainly gets addressed. So, uh, and I think if, it, if it's not there, then probably everybody defaults to you know, where we've been for the entire history of humanity, which is men, appointing more men you know it's only when the challenge comes and you shine a light on things that the men start to behave differently and and the women start to behave differently so leadership is just the thing then there's a whole pile of stuff below that which is how you get it done how you organize it studies mentioned you need targets you need monitoring you need uh, pressure you mentioned networks i think of, of women uh, mentoring programs, there's a whole raft of different things that sort of sit below it, but leadership is definitely the number one. If I may, just may say one thing about figures and achievement, I mean, I think it is great that the dynamics of boards of listed companies in, in the UK have, have changed. Um, and I, I think the dynamics of the things that are outside the scope of this review, law firms, uh, big advertising firms, and all that sort of stuff, lots of unlisted companies, I think are, 
em employing uh, more women as well, uh, or having more women on the boards. We still have a really serious problem of ultimate leadership uh, in terms of gender balance. I mean, you know, of the FTSE 350, there's 12 women who are CEOs or something like that. You know, it's absolutely trivial uh, in terms of women getting to the top CEO jobs. And even the executive committees are 20%, you know, a little bit lower than 20% for the FTSE 250, a little bit more for the FTSE 100. So the higher you go, the more male you are still at the executive levels. So, I mean, you know, we're in the last year of this review, uh, and I think we will either hit our targets or get very close to hitting pretty much all of the targets, and that's good news because it shows progress. But it doesn't show, in my view, that we're at a sensible resting place. We still have to work out why it is that we still have far too few female CEOs and the other really top positions in business. It's still too low. Mm -hmm. And that was, that was going to be one of my questions. Um, if you were to say the most pressing issue for the next five years should be this point, do you think is it, it is getting more women into, or is there any else that you think is quite critical that we start focusing on? Um, mm -hmm. I mean, I, it is important, and I think that should absolutely be the next phase. Moving through to gender balance is important, so moving from the minimum 33% threshold. And, you know, I, I don't honestly think there's a magic number. I don't think it's 50-50, but something that feels and looks. We all know when we walk into a room or, or are in a team or sit at a table, and it feels like there's roughly the right gender balance, and, and I think that's um, where we should be aiming for next. So. So that's really important. As Philip said, you know, getting more women into these really important chair and but but include inc more important um, CEO roles mm. is where we need to focus next. Those are very big jobs. Am I disappointed? Well, I'm clearly disappointed that we haven't gone further on the CEO progression. Um, am I surprised? Maybe not. You know, I, I do think that that getting a good spread of women into the top CEO roles. These are, you know, there's only 300 of them in the FTSE 350, and they're the biggest jobs, arguably, that we have in the UK. So for us to have made really strong progress there, I think that's probably, we should expect that to be in, in the next stage. Um, that, to my mind, is the very last hill almost to conquer, and, and I think we always expected that. And that's when we know you know, when we see good representation of women in foot, as FTSE CEOs, then we know that we've pretty much done this job and, mm. uh, and it's time to, to, to sit back. But we're a, a long way off that yet, actually. Mm. So I think it's gender balance. It's more women in the executive layer. And, it, you know, it is starting to build from the bottom, but it's not going fast enough. Yeah. And you, you raised a point earlier, Sir Philip, about how important leadership is for the changes. What about uh, leadership transitions? Because we have seen a few women, uh, CEO level women step down. We also have seen some men who were very active in balancing their board step down. And some of these companies struggle. So how, how, do, you th how do you create a lasting effect that actually goes beyond you as a leader? Well, I think uh, it, it depends on that. I, I think we have now got embedded the expectation that the boardroom will have some sort of gender balance. I, I just think well, you know, it's not done and maybe there'll be another higher target, but I don't think there's a debate around that. And everybody knows the processes and routines and mechanisms with headhunters and so on to, to get there. Um, the, 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 the real top CEO positions are the thing, and I frankly think it's, it, I think we do come down to bias and expectation and history and, you know, this is what we've always done and the face of leadership is still a, still a man. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I think that's why Denise absolutely right, this will be a longer journey because you have to change expectations that have been there forever. Um, it does, uh, I think it will, it will grow and it will grow slowly. I think the mechanism is there partly actually in this review because and although I've banged on about the, the, the ultimate role for women, 
this level that we measured for the first time ever, and I think we're the only country in the world that is measuring this, uh, the executive committee and people who re report to members of the executive committee, we're now at about 30%. So the, there are 23,000 people occupy those roles, execco and people who resort, report to execco. Those are the top jobs in listed companies. They're the most highly paid jobs, almost certainly in the country. Uh, close to a third of them are now occupied by women. So we have this fantastically deep cadre now of women who are really doing well in big complex businesses and holding down top executive jobs, six or 7,000 of them. That's fabulous. We just want to see more of them in the ultimate leadership positions. Yeah, I think that's absolutely right. And just to add on, you know, on, on the CEO, the numbers are flat if you look at the CEO progression over a decade. And frustratingly, for every new CEO who is appointed into that role, then another one leaves. So we saw that just recently with Alison Rose at RBS who was announced as the CEO um, you know, to, 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 to grade acclaim. And then a, a couple of weeks later, Alison Cooper at Imperial Tobacco announced after nine years, she was stepping down. So, um, and this, this, is, this is what we're dealing with, because of course, in order to make progress, you have to replace women with women mm -hmm. to stand still. And you have to then replace men with women in order to make progress. So it is frustratingly slow, but I, I think on the, the point about transition from one leader to another, you know, as Philip said earlier, disappointingly, we have seen new chairs come in for boards that would have been right at the top of the rankings, um, that were our, you know, our go-to companies for, um, for quotes and how to do it in the early days, that they've had a change of chair, mm -hmm. and suddenly the women on that board have uh, left and been replaced by men. And we've seen a few companies in that category. So clearly that's a concern. And you know, it, also, um, it also leads us on to look deeper and harder at what is, what is going on, what are the complex and compounding barriers that face women in getting it and staying to the top. And we know so much more now about behaviors, about um, about you know about about what works as well about how microaggressions very small behavioral changes can change people's aspirations of what they can expect of themselves but can also um, turn people who are different to senior white men in in any way or, or, or capacity um, have them feel this isn't the place for them and they they don't fit and, and they leave or move on so you know, spending a lot of time looking at those behaviours and what works and what doesn't is now the really quite advanced stage that we're at. I, I think I would say we have all of those issues now out on the table in a way that many of the countries that adopted quota legislation early on don't have. Mm -hmm. There is a piece of uh, very credible uh, research published in the UK by a house every single in the UK on UK diversity every single week of the year. So we get to the end of the year and we have 50 to 60 pieces of great credible research on diversity. Other in the UK, other countries are not doing that. We have all of the issues out on the table. We just don't have all the answers yet. Can I can I just add one thing about the numbers, particularly for women in this room who are thinking about managing their own careers uh, over time, either in executive levels or eventually non-executive um, positions on boards because you know some of that data we saw right at the start going from 25 to 33 percent as a target you know maybe doesn't sound very much but the, the if you look at how long people stay and how you know, as he said people drop off boards after you know several years and then people come on actually to to get the numbers to go up from 25 to 33 percent or indeed, you know, from executive committee levels from 20% uh, to 33%, you do need a re an appointment rate of women at sort of 40% plus. And that's actually what we have been experiencing in recent years, that not, f not far short of 50% of these appointments are actually going to women. So although the starting point is crazy, and listen, the position we were in 10 years ago was madness, um, there's never been a better time to be a woman aspiring to top positions in business because the, the recruitment rate and the appointment rate is now really quite high, very high. Mm -hmm. So I mean, that's a fabulous opportunity for you all. Yeah, that, no, that's true actually, yeah. that yeah. is really true. It's yeah. almost one in two roles yeah. that are available. 
um, and it used to be something like one in eight, one in nine. Yeah, it's not a revolution is, is actually revolution. underway. It may not feel like it for you know, <laughs> but it actually is in terms of the appointment rate of top women. Well, on that note, um, I know that there are some younger women here who may be in the earlier phases of their career. So, what would you recommend? they start investing in that would really help them get a role on the FTSE board? Well, I'd go back to what I said at the beginning, that it's really important to have a um, solid and as long as you can corporate career, whatever sector that happens to be in, whether you're in, um, in, in industry, in education, in financial services, the arts, I would recommend everybody actually that they develop themselves, their experience, their qualifications um, as richly and as deeply and get to the, uh, as far up the tree as they possibly can before they start to think about jumping out onto boards. I think there's a, a stage at maybe late 40s, early 50s when some transitionary roles are helpful. So. Uh, some smaller boards or even starting with, with a, you know, a school governor role or something like that, just to see how it is to operate and achieve in a very different environment to your, to your own um, and, and, and then build on from there. But I, I think you, you, know, you, you need to be financially literate for a start, so understanding the numbers is really important, whatever sector you're in. Um, and. Uh, you know, learning the soft skills as well, learning how to get along with colleagues, how to influence, and not just to be good at your job, but how to bring people with you, how to be out in front and have people willing to follow you. Uh, and all of those things are, are skills that need to be honed in your, in your, you know, your day-to-day -day workplace early on in your career. So there's, um, I don't know, but you'll have other things to add to that. Yeah, I mean, we, we, we've spent some time talking about, you know, big global percentages and, you know, thousands of people in, on board positions and whatever. I, actually, all, all this does come down to individuals. Uh, and I've spent a long 15 years, 16 years uh, mentoring individual women in a sort of very formal way through mentoring programs oh. and so on. Um, and I've mentored men as well. And I think that there's one universal thing about the experience I've had uh, mentoring women is, uh, and I've said it to all of them, I think they've all actually done really well, they've all certainly got board positions or got promotions and so on, um, is aspire, identify your ambition and have a go at it. Uh, and so many of them have been reluctant actually to do either of those things, actually to identify their, their, what their ultimate ambition is and then really to, to push at it. Uh, and I'm very, I've been very careful, I still try to be very careful about um, generalizations between men and women because I think there's an awful lot more similarities than we sometimes uh, recognize. But I think this is a generalization that to me holds true. That if, if a man thinks he's got, you know, five of the attributes out of ten for the job, he'll have a crack at it. A woman wants to get all ten before, you know, she wants to put in her application. I mean, it's not universally true, but I think it is widely true. I don't know. I have no idea why that is, but it's something that I think I've observed. So I've, I've said to all of them, uh, you know, have a crack, uh, and because the men will. Uh, and when I became chairman of GSK, I uh, spent an hour or two with all of the members of the executive committee, as new chairman do, and I asked all of them what their ambitions were, and what they wanted to do, what was making them happy or sad, and that sort of stuff, uh, getting to know them. Uh, and uh, when I finally got to Emma Wormsley, I said, and, and all of them had said, I'm very happy here, and I really like the CEO, and I'm, you know, I'll see where my sort of ambition takes me. And then they dodged really the question. I talked to Emma, and she said, I want to be CEO of a large international public company by the age of 50. She was then, I think, 47. And she said, I'd like it to be this company. But if it isn't this company, I'll try and find another. So, you know, she had the rank that she wanted to be CEO, she wanted to, you know, the type of company that she wanted to be CEO of, and the time period to get there. So, you know, she had it all sort of set out. That, to me, was incredibly refreshing because she was being completely honest and completely clear, and she had a, she had a plan and she had a strategy to, to get there. Right. Everybody needs that, male or female. Yeah, and let's face it, most men do have actually. Yeah, they may not, may, they may not disclose it, in fact, they're, but, but they have it. But they often have it, exactly. Mm -hmm. And I, I talk to a, a lot of younger women and it's the one thing that, yeah. that 
is quite frustrating that often they have not thought through where they want to go mm. or what they want to do, or even if they have, they're not saying it often enough. And I would advise all women in management, in senior management, to be very clear about what, what you see as the next job for you and what you, know, what you need to do, what you need to develop, how you're going to get there. And every single opportunity you have the chance to, to be having that conversation with your boss, with others who you think can, can influence that. And I think you can't say louder often enough where you want to go and ask how you're going to get there and, and, and sadly women are quite slow in coming forward and, and saying that in the robust and frequent way they should. Because you're most likely to appoint somebody who really wants the job. Mm -hmm. I mean it's a very obvious thing to say yeah. but you're, you're exactly. less likely to appoint somebody who's not sure whether they want the job or whether or not they're ready for it. Yes, so. yes. While talking about aspirations, one of our aspirations was to work with the Hampton Alexander Review and we had um, a piece in the 2019 report, uh, Dr. Sonia Falconieri, who is right there, Faculty of Finance, uh, submitted a piece where we saw how it, we stand, UK stands among other major companies, uh, countries. Where do you think UK stands with respect to other countries? And you have come, actually you have mentioned or you referred to this quite a few times. We used a different mechanism, a lot of countries used quotas. Um, but where do you think we stand overall when you look at the numbers and when you think about the underlying mechanisms? I mean, uh, should I start? Uh, yeah. I, I, think, um, I think we're in a, a good position. If you look at those stats that are in our report, the UK is currently sixth, um, so around 33%. Uh, the top of the tree is France, so the CAC 40 with 42%. Norway next, Finland, Sweden with around 38 36%. So those are all countries that introduce legislation um, that have made no more progress, interestingly, in the executive pipeline than we have done in the UK. But they introduced quotas many years ago. They have fines, penalties, delisting measures, uh, and also removal of chairman measures. None of those do we have. We have. I, mean, I often hear people say the Hampton Alexander Review is powerful. We, well, Philip and I feel completely powerless, actually, because we have in the UK no measures and we have chosen intentionally to um, to take that route for the first five to ten years. I think the other thing to um, to note fundamental difference in how we are measuring progress and um, and other countries are that you'll see in the report is that they're measuring against 40 companies. So they have 42% women on just 40 listed companies. We are doing this in a big way and at scale. So we're measuring and tracking across 350 listed companies. Uh, Norway has only 20, Finland 30, you know, very, very small numbers. I often say if we were just looking at 30 companies in the UK, we could trot around there in, you know, in a few weeks actually and have a chat with all of them. And that would be great. We're talking about 350 companies. Uh, and as Philip said, not just boards, we're also measuring the next layer down, which is the executive committee and the direct reports to 23,000 uh, leadership roles, arguably our biggest leadership roles in the UK. Uh, and I think when you, when you look at the detail and you, you do that comparison, then I think we are making great progress across uh, against every other country in the world. Mm. One of my uh, one of my female mentees I talked about uh, from a completely different company, but I was mentoring her through a formal program. She uh, she's an English woman uh, who uh, actually she's Scottish, but uh, she joined she's fluent in French, uh, and she joined the board of a Cap Current uh, company uh, two years ago, uh, and um, uh, as uh, she described it as a job lot of three women at the same time went onto this board in order to meet the, uh, the, the requirement, uh, which is I think by the end of 2018, wasn't it? And, uh, and I, I saw her a few months after she joined this board of a large French company and I said, how's it going? Uh, and she said, it's absolutely dreadful. Um, I said, why? And she said, well, he said, because what? They, they didn't want us. They, they, they've only appointed me and the other two women because the law requires it. 
and they get fined and criticised and whatever if they don't. So, but but the, uh, what's happening at the moment is the men all meet separately, and they decide everything, uh, but in a dinner the night before or something like that. And then for the formal board meeting, they get the women in to rubber stamp it. So, uh, and she was in quite a pickle about this because she had all the responsibilities of a, of a director, but in terms of you know de facto involvement in board decisions. She was irrelevant. Mm. And I think that, I mean, that may be an extreme example, and you know, they sorted it out. Uh, but I think this is what can happen when you impose things. Uh, we, we don't have any weapons as, uh, other than shining a light on things that we think are disappointing. Uh, and the media and investors have been very helpful in that. But if you make it a legal requirement, you can get some very different dynamics. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you very much for your work on the review itself and also for being with us tonight. It was such a pleasure and I'm sure there are many more questions, some of which uh, our audience may be able to ask in the atrium. So I invite you all to join us for a quick drink or a coffee before you leave and good night. Thank you.